Good afternoon. I'm Mark Plattner, the editor of the Journal of Democracy and the Vice President for Research and Studies here at the National Endowment for Democracy. It's my great pleasure to welcome all of you to today's panel celebrating the publication of Democratization and Authoritarianism in the Arab World, a new book edited by Larry Diamond and me and published by the Johns Hopkins University Press. If I'm not mistaken, this is the 30th uh, Journal of Democracy book that Johns Hopkins has published since the series began in 1993. These volumes, which mostly but not exclusively draw upon articles that previously appeared in the journal, have addressed a very wide range of thematic and regional issues related to democratization around the world. For any of you who may not be familiar with the Journal of Democracy, it's a quarterly publication sponsored by the National Endowment for Democracy that has become a leading global forum for serious analysis of the problems and prospects of democracy around the world. Larry Diamond, who's my co also my co-editor at the journal, will serve as the moderator of today's discussion, and I'll limit myself here to just a few brief remarks, mostly about the book itself. Today, given the intense worldwide focus on the shattering events in Ukraine, the Arab world for the first time in several years is no longer at the center of attention for those who follow global politics or democracy. And some might even say that the so-called Arab Spring that began early in 2011 has proven to be merely a brief eruption that left behind a great deal of violence and very little democracy. Yet it would be premature to discount the impact of the Arab uprisings of recent years. Not only have they made possible a still promising democratic transition in Tunisia and frail but still not yet aborted transitions in Yemen and Libya, they also have changed the face of Arab politics and given many Arab citizens a taste of freedom that will not soon be forgotten. Regardless of how one evaluates the events of 2011 through 2013, they must be considered a critical juncture in the struggle to bring democracy to Arab lands. In their regional sweep, they are rivaled only by the wave of transformations in Eastern Europe and Eurasia in 1989 to 91. The Journal of Democracy monitored the Arab uprisings and their aftermath intensively, and our book reflects the range and variety of our coverage. It's not easy, of course, for a quarterly to stay on top of rapidly unfolding events, and we could not expect our authors unfailingly to hit a moving target. <coughs> so along with some impressively prescient and accurate assessments, the book no doubt contains some judgments that now seem outdated or perhaps belied by events. In fact, one thing we've asked our panelists to do today is to reflect on how they might have altered the analyses that they contributed to the book if they were rewriting their article today. But we also believe there's real value in bringing together essays that show how key developments in the evolution of the Arab Spring were perceived at the time they occurred. Democratization and authoritarianism in the Arab world is quite large for an edited volume, containing 29 chapters along with an introductory essay. Sixteen of these chapters consist of broad thematic essays <coughs> with region-wide application that address such questions as the relation between Islam and democracy, the role of Islamist parties and forces, Arab culture and public opinion, and the reasons why different countries pursued very different paths during the Arab Spring. The remaining 13 chapters are devoted to case studies of individual countries with multiple chapters on Egypt and Tunisia and individual chapters on Yemen, Libya, Syria, Bahrain, Algeria, Morocco, Jordan, and Saudi Arabia. At the conclusion of today's uh, panel, 
We'll have copies of the book available for sale at the back of the room for those who might wish to purchase one. I'll leave to Larry the privilege of introducing our panelists, all of whom have contributed at least one chapter of the book. But let me say a word about Larry himself. He's one of the world's most eminent scholars of democracy. He's a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution and at Stanford University's Friedman Spoli Institute for International Studies, where he directs Stanford Center on Democracy Development and the Rule of Law. And he also serves with me as co-chairman of the Research Council of the National Endowment for Democracy's International Forum for Democratic Studies. Before we begin, I want to call attention to the superb job that was done by the Journal of Democracy staff, first in editing these articles when they initially appeared in the journal, and then in preparing the book for publication. All the essays were e edited either by our executive editor, Phil Kostopoulos, who's in the back, uh, or our senior editor, Tracy Brown, who I'm sure is here somewhere, also in the back. And our managing editor, Brent Calmer, who's not here today, handled the production and design of both the original articles and the subsequent book with his customary assurance and efficiency. And our assistant editor, Nate Grubman, Grubman played an extremely valuable role in helping to draft the introduction, so much so that Larry and I agreed that he should be listed along with us as a co-author of that introduction. Nate is also in the back of the room. Uh, I also want to thank Melissa Aiton, Becknell, Jessica Ludwig, and Dean Jackson of the International Forum for Democratic Studies for their help in organizing today's presentation. And I also want to note the presence here today of Suzanne Flinchbaugh, our book editor at Johns Hopkins University Press. Um, those of you who are on Twitter, I'm told, can follow this panel discussion and contribute to the conversation by using the hashtag NED events or by following the forum at Think Democracy and the endowment at NE Democracy. And now please join me in silencing your cell phones and I'm very pleased to turn uh, the floor over to Larry Diamond. Larry? Okay, thank you so much Mark and thank you again to everyone who is acknowledged and thanked by Mark. Uh, we're very grateful to three of our authors for agreeing to participate in this reflection on the book and uh, where the Arab world is now uh, in the wake of uh, this publication and in the wake of all of the developments of um, the last three plus years. Um, I'm going to briefly introduce our speakers. They'll speak each for about 10 minutes uh, in the order that I'll introduce them. I may ask them a few more questions and try and get them to fight with one another intellectually. Uh, and then we'll have plenty of time for you to um, pose your questions or challenges to them and to all of us. Um, Dan Brumberg uh, is one of our oldest, part, oldest in terms of longest serving <laughs> partners uh, in the Journal of Democracy. In <laughs> fact, he joined our editorial board at a very early stage of his career and um, has uh, been very influential in shaping uh, our coverage of um, uh, the political developments related to the Arab world and to uh, the Islamic world more broadly. He's an associate professor of government and co-director of the MA program in democracy and governance at Georgetown University. He um, also serves as a special advisor at the U.S. Institute of Peace to its Muslim World Initiative, where he focuses on democratization and political reform in the Middle East and the wider uh, Islamic world. Hillel Fradkin uh, has also been a longtime partner and interlocutor uh, with the Journal of Democracy and our Studies Center here at NED. He's a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute where he directs its Center on Islam, Democracy, and the Future of the Muslim World. <clears throat> He's a founder and co-editor of the Center's Current Trends in Islamist Ideology, and he's taught at Chicago, Columbia, Yale, uh, and Georgetown, and bridges uh, the worlds of um, 
uh, intellectual life uh, and, and policy and practice. Tarek Masood, we've gotten to know somewhat more recently, but uh, we're very excited about the work he's doing uh, and uh, that he's also contributed to the Journal of Democracy. He's an associate professor of public policy at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard, where he teaches courses on comparative political institutions, democratization, and Middle Eastern politics. His new book is just about out, right, uh, with Cambridge University Press, Counting Islam, Religion, Class, and Elections in Egypt. And he's the, also the author of a very widely acclaimed book, Order, Conflict, and Violence, with Cambridge University Press. So I'll ask you each, beginning with you, Dan, to um, reflect on what you wrote and on the challenges of democratization and authoritarianism at this moment in the Arab world. Well, uh, there you go, Larry. Thank you. Uh, I first want to say uh, that I very much appreciate the opportunity to be with my old comrades and friends at this uh, at this meeting and to have contributed to this volume. Um, the list of uh, contributors is extraordinary, and it attests to the widening uh, arena of scholars who are doing serious work uh, on the Arab world and the wider. Middle East, when we started this venture, the notion that we were going to work on the Arab world seemed uh, to be uh, fantastic to a lot of people. And I recall back in the day, 1888, 89, where we sort of had to hold meetings just to sort of t put this on the agenda and to convince people this was a credible thing to, that needed to be studied. And the journal was way ahead of the curve. Um, I mean that. I mean, it, it really. Uh, was prepared to start asking important questions long before some folks out there, both in the policy and the academic world, were ready to uh, think about them seriously. So I think it's to a credit to the, to the journal that it has devoted so much time, attention, and space, and Larry uh, uh, has done such a good job uh, with Mark in, in making that happen. So I really think, I appreciate, I'm sure that many people who, in this audience who've also contributed to that effort recognize how important it was that the journal and Ned was so much ahead of the curve on this matter. Um, I've been asked to reflect on, um, on the piece I wrote. Um, would I rewrite it any differently? Um, you know, when I wrote the piece, and, and, and uh, Mark was mentioning sort of how do you deal with events that are changing as you're writing them, and I finished it and I said I had two predictions. Things were grim in Egypt and wouldn't work out, and things were okay in Tunisia and would work out. And then things were not looking so good in Tunisia. And every wet day, I almost I woke up and said, oh my god, when are they going to, you know, I, Radwan's in the audience. I can't say, when are you going to get that constitution? I've been written in the journal that's going to work out. You know, I, let's go. I mean, my reputation is on the line. <laughs> and uh, and uh, lo and behold, even a week before the constitution was finally agreed on, I met with Tunisian colleagues who didn't know what was going to go on. And suddenly it happened. But I felt, uh, and I'm saying this for a serious reason, and that is I think that yeah, this may sound somewhat self-serving, but the analytical framework that I tried to set out in that article comparing Egypt and, and Tunisia uh, is, an, is a framework that I think uh, I'm more convinced than ever, I have to say. I mean, I, is, is, is a useful way to think about uh, the, the challenges of moving from uh, what I call authoritarian uh, uh, rackets, protection rackets, to democratic protection rackets, or democratic governance. Um, and um, it, 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 the, the paradigm itself focuses on the dynamics of conf conflict and identity uh, in Arab political systems. That paradigm is by no means limited to uh, the cases of the Arab world. Uh, let's just look at Ukraine right now as another example of you know, where the issue of identity politics and autocracy intersect and democracy. Uh, but I think the issues of identity conflict are especially prescient in the Arab world for a variety of reasons. And it's not something that we really expected in the sense that when the revolt started, of course, in Tunisia and the rural areas, not in the part of the metropolitan Tunis capital, but in the rural areas, it was about a revolt uh, searching for social and economic equality and dignity. Um, and so many of the initial slogans in the rebellion, not only in Tunisia, and I much prefer the notion of uh, Arab political rebellions in the Arab Spring, um, 
uh, what, and, uh, as well as in Egypt and elsewhere, these rebellions were uh, in part or in large measure initially about issues of economic and social justice, dignity, and things like that. Tom Friedman wrote a long piece some months ago about the whole intersection in Syria between the, the issue of water and, and uh, sca water scarcity and, and the environment and the rest of it and how that played a critical role in, uh, in the revolt in, in Syria. So people were um, sort of caught unaware by the extent to which um, the issue of identity politics has loomed so large. And I use the term very deliberately because I don't think the issue, as I've written in the past, I wrote a piece some so two or three years ago, maybe more, you know how time flies, called Islam is not the solution or the problem. And I argued that it's, the issue is much more about how different segments of these communities with different identity priorities can learn to live together democratically as opposed to having a kind of peaceful coexistence in, or not so peaceful coexistence in an authoritarian system. And I think, therefore, uh, that the identity issue is, looms large, but many people were surprised by it. Um, I remember that Gilles Capel wrote a piece, oh, it was about six months ago, when he said he was shocked that the issue of secular Islamist conflict in Egypt had loomed so large. And I was, I was thinking, my gosh, I mean, Gilles, this is a man who knows Egypt well. We've been friends for a long time. But, you know, uh, sometimes it's, it's not easy to sort of stand back from what you, what you know and sort of see the, the terrain. Um, and the terrain was very much organized. And the reason why I was not so surprised about the fact that things shifted so quickly from a focus on social and economic justice and dignity to a struggle over identity is that the political systems had in large part been organized around what I call protection racket systems in which uh, uh, governments, regimes backed by strong militaries in many cases, provided uh, social and economic protection to vulnerable minorities or communities in return for their acquiescence to their power. Um, and that sort of relationship, which I had called a long time ago a ruling bargain, um, that kind of relationship meant that in many respects the dynamics of um, identity conflict were institutionalized deeply before we saw the Arab political revolts explode onto the political arena, and deeply embedded among uh, contested polit contesting political elites who did or did not necessarily have linkages to those other social groups that were revolting against the system that they saw as corrupt, inefficient, and unfair. Um, and so when the elite politics shifted, it shifted in the context of that protection racket system um, and didn't necessarily at all transcend it. And I think that's, that's the, in, in that sense, uh, it, I, it was, in, you know, in retrospect, nothing is surprising, right? When you look back, um, uh, that, that's, that's for sure. But, I had been thinking about this stuff for a long time, and while I was hoping that it would shift to the pragmatics of social and economic struggles, it, it didn't. Um, now, when we think about transitions, I think we think about the, the transition paradigm. I, I, I still think it's, in many respects, still an important intellectual and theoretical contribution, but the paradigm assumed that democratization would emerge not because people were committed to democracy intellectually, but because people were using democratic rules as a mechanism of conflict resolution, initially, the notion of a democracy without Democrats. But that presupposed that there was really no basic identity conflict. Mm -hmm. It really did. And so the extent to which, here's the paradox. I think that, that the, the, the authors of that paradigm were correct. You need a, a, some sort of political bargain or pact to make a transition but it's particularly difficult to have a pact when the struggle is not over economic and social issues uh, exp uh, explicitly, but over identity issues. How do you bargain identity issues? Much more difficult than dealing with the demands of labor, the rates of inflation, and so on. If you compare the struggle over a pact in Brazil, let's say, to Egypt. Um, the Brazilians were not trying to figure out their national identity. The Poles were really not trying to figure out their national identity. But the struggle in Egypt was over national identity um, in many ways. Um, and and the, the question, therefore, is how do you move from a, as I said before, an authoritarian protection racket system uh, to a democratic one? And in each case, you have a different set of variables. And I'm not going to do a, a boring political science presentation here, God forbid, about those variables. Even the word variable scares me a little bit. But, um, uh, or even dependent variable. Uh, but I, I think that the structure of that relationship really helps to, in retrospect, again, understand the difficulties as well as the opportunities. In Egypt, you had a basic struggle between 
uh, a, a military-led regime that had offered protection to different elements of the, the community, to cops, to the business community, uh, to, uh, to secular intellectuals. But the key thing about the uh, protection racket in Egypt, uh, it, well, there are two things. First of all, it was maintained by a powerful military, which has sustained itself, as we well know. And, um, uh, and in the end, it, the, the protection racket not only provided protection to, um, to secular groups, to, the, to business leaders, but also to Islamists. Islamists were always negotiating with the regime, and they continued that game and they thought they could reach a political pact under Morsi with the military. And who guess who laughed last? Uh, that was really the Egyptian story. Morsi did not in any effective way reach out to do what uh, a leader has to if you're going to move to a democratic system, and that is reassure the losers of their basic rights. If you can't project to the losers, particularly if the losers have the military behind them, if you can't signal that you're going to, you're going to come up with a bargain uh, that protects their rights, you're not going to get a transition. And in the struggle over the Egyptian constitution, Morsi and the Ikhwan Muslimin did not really signal to the, uh, to the secularists that they had a place in the system. The secularists, or many of them, backed the Islamists. Uh, I thought the, uh, I have two minutes, I thought the coup was, in many respects, I call it a coup, I'm not ashamed of it, was a mistake. I think uh, a democratic crisis requires a democratic solution. Um, but, uh, and look where we are today, I think what we have in Egypt is a system that is about as close to fascism as we can now find. It really is, in the technical sense of the term from a political science point, uh, fascistic in so many ways. Tunisia benefited from a very, well, Tunisia had a very sharp secular Islamist divide, there's no doubt about it, but there they didn't have a military to appeal to to resolve their collective action problem. And so they either talk or they fight. Oh, they fought a lot, you know. I'm still sure they're going to still fight a lot. But at the end of the day, they appealed to their own sense of self-interest, but also to the arbitrating role of the trade unions and other institutions, and resolved the, the political pact through creating a constitution. And there I remain um, optimistic. I think it's much more difficult in countries such as Bahrain and Syria, where you have a small, relatively small minority that sees democratization as, 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 as an existential threat because an election could mean that they are overwhelmed by the majority. And the Alawites, there was a piece in the Times about this today, the Alawites do not see any democratic outcome they can live with. The Bahrain Sunni government does not see a democratic outcome they can live with. So structurally there are cases that, that are much more uh, 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 vulnerable to uh, reassertion of authoritarianism. I think the kind of authoritarianism we have now in Bahrain and Egypt is worse than anything we had before. But you also have, depending on the lay of the land, opportunities. I see them in Tunisia. I still remain not completely pessimistic, let's put it that way, about Yemen. Um, and in Libya, well, I, you know, there I, I have, uh, I, I can't be overly pessimistic because once you do not deal with the issue of militias early on, uh, you have a real path-dependent situation. So th there are a variety of outcomes in the region. I would only close by saying w the following. You know, in the wake of the, the revolts in <clears throat> Tunisia and Egypt, there was a sudden surge of sort of optimism. Um, and those of us who had spent our careers writing about the mechanics of autocracy were told, ah, oh, well, you know, you know, you and Heidemann and all those other guys, you know, you, you, you were wrong. And it's not a question whether we're wrong or we're right, but we have to put aside great expectations and look at the historical context and really embed our understanding of what's possible in the, in the complexities of these systems. They're, they're always in their own history. It's not a matter of being in history or out of it. They're in their own histories, and we have to take those histories and those legacies seriously. Thank you very much. Okay, Dan, thank you uh, very much. It probably would have been a useful service if I had told uh, uh, the audience what you had written on, but uh, in fact you did it very well. Uh, your topic was transforming the Arab world's protection racket politics. Um, uh, it's not bad, Dan. Um, it's almost as good as uh, liberalized autocracy. Um, uh, and uh, Hillel Fradkin in this volume has shared with us, uh, with us some of his work on um, Islamist thought and mobilization. His title is Arab Democracy or Islamist Revolution. So three years later, Hillel, which is it?
There we go. Uh, well, first, before getting to that, I want to thank, uh, as others have, uh, Larry and Mark for, for this work and for the work of the, of the National Endowment for Democracy. I also, uh, Mark observed early on in his remarks that uh, the world's uh, attention is moving on from the Arab Spring uh, because of the crisis with Ukraine. Um, that's extremely rude of uh, Vladimir Putin to have done so. Uh, but it does mean that this may be the last time for some time that we will have a, uh, an opportunity to discuss these matters because other issues will emerge. Um, I will talk a little bit about uh, the article I wrote and um, um, uh, what it said and, and, and how it looks today. Uh, but to focus my remarks that way, I think requires me to uh, go another 15 rounds with Olivier Wa, uh, which would be time consuming and unfair to Olivier. So um, I just want, want to begin really with uh, what was largely the task of the session, which is to reassess the Arab Spring uh, some three plus years uh, and to indicate what we have learned. And by this, I, meant, I suppose it's meant that we have been asked to offer an interpretation of what has happened over the, the, the past three years. So I thought it would be best to begin by stating what has happened, uh, or what are the major facts concerning the Arab Spring, as at least I see it. And for this purpose, I would include in such facts regional developments that go beyond the circumstances within the specific Arab countries that underwent revolts. I think it proper to include them for several reasons. First, uh, which bear upon, as I'll indicate to our subject. First, because the countries of the Middle East have the habit of thinking of themselves regionally and sometimes acting as such. And such has been the case with the Arab Spring, with various countries both acting upon the region and being acted upon by it. This is, of course, almost inevitable in any part of the world. But it is especially the case in the Middle East because most of its countries share not only a ge geographic place, but the common ground of being Muslim and of identifying themselves as such. And second, and related to it, because the question of Islam and its relationship to these revolts became almost immediately an aspect important to understanding them and has remained so. The net result was that all Muslim countries in the region non-Arab as well as Arab, saw themselves as having a stake, whether positive or negative, in the outcome of the revolts. And to the extent either necessary or possible, they have mostly acted as such. This has proven, I think, to have broad and deep consequences for the fate of the Arab revolts, both in themselves and for regional politics as a whole. The most obvious, crucial, and appalling case is Syria and its civil war. For this war and the revolt which launched it has by now drawn in one way or another almost every country in the region. And of course it is now being fought as a struggle between Sunni and Shiite Islam. This consequence was not strictly speaking anticipated. I certainly won't claim to have done so. But in the end it may prove to be the most significant consequence of the Arab Spring for both Arab and regional politics. Almost as obvious is the case of Egypt, whose revolutionary dynamic has attracted the concern and intervention of other countries, both Arab and non-Arab, especially Turkey in the latter category. And this regional engagement also forms part of the facts of the Arab Spring. And I would add here, and we'll come a little bit back to the, that the dynamic of Turkey's own politics has a bearing for the questions raised by the Arab Spring. But of course, the core of the Arab Spring was the Arab countries and their revolts. At the beginning, the revolts presumptively, had presumptively two goals. First, the overthrow of the existing autocrats, and second, the replacement of autocratic regi regimes as such with new democratic ones. Where does this stand? Well, four of the five autocrats are gone. The exception is Bashir al-Assad, who now looks as if he will survive. And apart from uh, Umar Gaddafi, he's, he's the worst of the, the lot. Um, 
But the establishment of new democratic regimes has largely failed to ma materialize. One possible exception is Tunisia. What happened? Obviously, there were different factors in different countries that have contributed to this failure. And no doubt, we will explore today those differences in our discussion. But here I would like to focus on Egypt, which seems to me the most crucial or important case for several reasons. And it also happens to be the, was largely the focus of the article uh, uh, in, the, in the journal and in the, this volume. First, it is the largest Arab country and was thus looked to as a model. It was the country in which the greatest hopes were invested. It did have a genuinely democratic revolution in the sense that it held more or less, and we may be inclined to forget this, more or less free elections, multiple free elections, which produced a new regime. The Islamist regime of the Muslim Brotherhood, supported by other Islamist parties. As we all know, that regime has failed and is in the process of being replaced by a new regime whose character is still uncertain, but may amount, uh, I take this, this is Dan's view, to um, the restoration of e Egyptian autocracy, if perhaps of a somewhat new kind. So what happened? How did this, uh, uh, what was the dynamic here, the trajectory here? At the beginning, and here I will make reference to the, the article, at the beginning of the Egyptian revolt, it seemed to me that the main beneficiary of the new political opening would be the Brotherhood. That did prove to be the case. It also seemed to me that the Brotherhood would be inclined to move relatively quickly to fulfill its 80-year-old vision of Islamic governance. I drew this conclusion from the statements of authoritative leaders like Khairat al-Shatr, as well as the history of the Brotherhood movement. The question at the time was really how quickly and, of course, how successfully. In the event, and I think um, I was prepared for it to move fairly quickly, but not as quickly as it did. It moved very quickly and for a while successfully. And I think partially because it was buoyed by very considerable public support, on the front end at least, and the support of related is Islamist allies like the Salafists. But of course, its reign ended last July. What have we learned from this experience, this particular experience of the Egyptian case? The Egyptian revolt, it seems to me, did in fact provide an opening to the expression of popular will, which for that reason, I think we may describe as a democratic opening. But its first expression was a kind of religious populism not particularly devoted to a democratic order. This plus other advantages is what led to the Brotherhood victories in the first place. But this populism, as it came to the fore, presented certain questions or problems. What kind of religion would it promote and how would it govern? These issues were never resolved. In particular, the Brotherhood never properly solved the issues of governance and to try and try to address them in an increasingly autocratic mode. I would say, uh, it doesn't excuse them, but uh, they had a lot of help because of the frustrations they encountered with um, um, the resistance of various authorities within the, within the government. At all events, this managed to produce both resentment and chaos and eventually failure. Brotherhood political skills proved unequal to their ambitions. Where does that leave Egypt today? It would be nice if the Brotherhood failure led to the emergence of an alternative political movement democratically inclined in a Western fashion. But such has not been the case. The constituency for such a movement was always weak, and it appears weaker still now. And I think part of the reason that is, uh, was underscored, uh, is underscored in Shadi Hamid's uh, new book that the um, uh, the constituency of Egypt is a very traditional and conservative one and, is, and uh, doesn't have a natural instinctual feel for uh, the kind of um, alternative, uh, that kind of alternative. This is not, I think, to say that popular will can no longer express itself. But, it, and it does, but it now endorses a new and charismatic savior in the person of General Sisi. 
is unclear what this will mean and how to interpret it. Insofar, insofar as CC is genuinely popular, popular will seems, still seems to have some power. Moreover, there, it seems to me the religious coloration of such populism may not be over. CC himself has suggested that he might try to appropriate it in some fashion, and it's notable that he contrived or connived to have the support of some Salafists uh, in his overthrow of Morsi. The net result may be a new regime which is religiously populist and authoritarian at the same time. Whether this can work will depend upon whether Sisi's political skills are superior to those of the Brotherhood. At the present time, I think this is correct, his main opponent in the elections will be Sabahi, who evokes an earlier form of Egyptian populism, the National Socialist Populism of Gamal Abdel Nasser. So we will have something of a test in the near term of which kind of populism is most appealing to the Egyptian public. I say some kind of test for, uh, for a lot of reasons. What is the bearing of the very particular Egyptian experience for the broader realm of Arab and regional politics? I confess I don't have a clue, but in any serious sense, but I do have three observations with which I will end. First, as in Egypt, the end or prospective end of autocracy led to the release of religious passions into the political sphere. And I think it could not help but do so since the newly, if briefly empowered, social constituencies define themselves religiously in accord with what uh, Dan was saying earlier about identity being the question. In some places more, in some places less. But as these constituencies were not of all of one mind, it has led to religious quarrels to play a still heightened role in politics, for example, and especially in Syria. Second, however Sisi may play things out in Egypt, the possibilities today of a religiously populist but authoritarian model may be explored elsewhere. Such at least is presently the case in Turkey, where Prime Minister Erdogan is pursuing it under the rubric, the new rubric of advanced democracy. At the beginning of the Arab Spring, many wondered whether it would follow the so-called Turkish model, and so it may, although in a sense now, which would be very, very ironic. Finally, overall, our topic remains subject to a question raised in the spring of 2011 in the wake of the death of Osama bin Laden. It was raised by a Lebanese professor named uh, Radwan Sayed, who said at the time as follows, the problem now is not how you can destroy something, how you can resist something, it's how you can build something new, a new state, a new authority, a new relationship between the public and leadership, a new civil society. Unhappily, Arab Spring has yet to find an answer to that question. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Hillel, uh, for those eloquent remarks. We're now going to uh, give the floor to uh, Tarek Masood. I'll note that Tarek has two articles uh, in this book. Uh, one uh, that he wrote, actually, I think almost three years ago now, uh, pretty soon after the Egyptian Revolution. I think we can say more cautiously hopeful piece, uh, maybe, than your view of the situation now. We're eager to hear it and another uh, an extremely influential uh, and uh, widely read essay uh, that um, he co-authored with Jason Brownlee and Andy Reynolds, which is now being enlarged into a book that will be published soon, trying to take stock of why the Arab Spring, quote unquote, happened in some countries and not in others. So whichever piece of that or this you want to talk about, the floor is yours. So th thank you very much. I'm sort of constitutionally incapable of speaking while seated, Your so I'm going to. You are entitled. All right. So um, I, I first want to thank. Sit down, uh, Tarek. <laughs> <laughs> Who's this upstart? I, I want to thank uh, Larry <coughs> and uh, Mark for inviting me to speak today. Um, I, I've been lucky enough to to write for the JOD a number of times. Uh, first time I wrote for JOD was when I was finishing my doctoral dissertation. I actually kind of had to lobby to get into JOD. I think Mark was somewhat dubious. Um, <laughs> and afterwards, I wrote the piece, and I wanted to really know what, you know, what Mark thought. And I, I said, so what did you think? And Mark said, well, you know, the good thing is you have your entire career ahead of you to develop gravitas. <laughs> 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 so every time I sit down to write something, I think of Mark Flatner's <laughs> words. And I don't know that I am um, good at taking the advice, but I certainly try to. Um, 
So as, as Larry, uh, my, uh, my, my uh, dear friend Larry has noted, uh, I was lucky enough to have two contributions in this volume. One was written in uh, June of 2011 when the revolution in Egypt was still fresh and the possibilities uh, seemed to be endless. And another was written in October of, of 2013 when the full scale of the Arab Spring's uh, disappointments uh, became evident. And each piece, I think, is reflective of its time. And so if you pardon me for being a little bit uh, navel-gazing here, I'll, 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 I'll take seriously the question that you asked, which is how, how, uh, what do we think we got wrong and how would we have done things differently? And the, the June 2011 piece, which is grandly entitled The Road to and from Liberation Square, Tahrir Square, I think was broadly optimistic about Egypt's prospects for democracy. And at that time, I actually believed that it was possible for Egyptians to get to a democratic order if, uh, if, and this is a very big if, all of the relevant political players, the political elites, from the military to the Muslim Brotherhood to the so-called secular or so-called liberal opposition to the so-called fulul or leftovers of the Mubarak regime, if all of those actors made all of the right decisions. Um, so I thought the military would actually have to acquiesce to democratic democratic authority. I thought the Islamists would have to resist the temptation to dominate um, uh, the political order. And I thought that non-Islamists would have to uh, acquiesce to the idea of having a political order that maybe has a little bit more religion in it than they might want. And I thought that both the Islamists and the non-Islamists who had made their uh, uh, who had come up as as non -Mubarak, as anti Mubarak opposition? I thought both of those would also have to resist the temptation to try to exclude the uh, former Mubarak regime because excluding the uh, Mubarakists would create a new class of spoilers who would try to tear down the entire Egyptian democratic edifice. And so I thought if everybody does all of these things, and you know this is Egypt, they can do it. They've surprised us before that if everybody does all of these things, uh, Egypt can make it to democracy. Of course, as we know, none of that came to pass. And more than that, it seems surpassingly quaint that anybody could have believed that this would come to pass. <laughs> So I kind of like to beat myself up. I'm a sort of neurotic person, and I, I sometimes crack that piece open to remind myself of my naivete. And I kind of always, I have to admit, I come away from it pleasantly surprised that I wasn't as dumb as I thought, because I did note at the end of that article that uh, Egypt was an extremely poor country, and that poor countries, even if they manage somehow to make it to democracy, they usually fail to keep it, right? Getting democracy is hard. Keeping democracy is actually harder. And I further noted that if Egypt detoured into Islamist dominion or into economic crisis or into chaos, people in that country and outside of that country would be begin to yearn for the lugubrious stability provided by the strong man. And I think Phil Kostopoulos helped me craft that <laughs> sentence, which I still like. Was that um, lugubrious? Was it? I think it was my, I think I had a worse word and we settled on lugubrious. <laughs> but the point is, in essence, that's kind of what happened. Um, the second piece that uh, I was uh, lucky enough to have in JOD was co-authored with two of the greatest intellectual partners a scholar could have, uh, Professor Jason Brownlee at the University of Texas and uh, Professor Andrew Reynolds at the University of North Carolina. And that <coughs> piece, uh, which is entitled Modest Harvest, is more consistent with the pessimism that was buried in my earlier uh, article. And in that article, in the second article, we basically survey the entire Arab world after the Arab Spring. And we note that, in fact, there was far more continuity in that part of the world than change. So during the revolutions, we may have been really thrilled by the ingenuity and savvy, savvy of technologically connected uh, young activists. Um, but we neglected to note that they seem to be failing much more often than they succeeded. And so in this article, we kind of take stock of the efforts of revolutionaries. And we note that of the 22 countries in the Arab League, only six of them really faced anything that we would characterize as a regime challenging uh, protest. Um, and that in only four of those cases did you actually get success, which we define very narrowly as overthrowing of an authoritarian uh, regime. And we note that protest success is predicted pretty well by just two uh, simple structural factors. Um, whether a regime had access to oil ranks, 
which allows you to buy two things, the quiescence of the people, and if that doesn't work, guns to beat them over the head. And the second is whether the regime had experienced successful hereditary succession, which we take as a proxy for regime cohesion. This part of the argument people kind of grapple with, it's actually quite simple. We're basically saying, look, if you manage in the 21st century to pass power from father to son, that's pretty good evidence that your regime is pretty tightly uh, bound if everybody in this regime from the coercive apparatus, et cetera, can sign on to that. Um, so basically, what we do in this new article is we try to redirect the attention that scholars have uh, put uh, on uh, from agents, from activists, et cetera, to structures. And so in our telling, it doesn't really matter how courageous and ingenious the youth were, or how effectively people made use of information technologies to overcome the collective action problem. Uh, the outcomes of all of these things were essentially uh, preordained. Now, this perspective uh, is really pessimistic. I know somebody once told me, hey, if you want to look like you're smart, always be pessimistic. Um, uh, um, but I also think it's useful not just for explaining the outcomes of protests, but I think also for explaining the outcomes of what happened in the places that actually managed to overthrow their dictators. So it's worth noting that of the four success cases that we have, Egypt, Yemen, Tunisia, and Libya, the first suffered a military coup. The second still hasn't had a multi-party democratic election. And more importantly, the person who rules Yemen right now is the vice president of the guy that they overthrew. Um, the third, Libya, as uh, Professor Brumberg has noted, has devolved into a state of near lawlessness. And only the fourth, only Tunisia, um, has managed to erect new democratic institutions and critically keep them afloat, although as, uh, uh, as both uh, Dan and Hillel have uh, noted, there's been a great deal of uh, polarization, there's been a great deal of political violence, including two assassinations in 2013. And so in fact, I'm actually far less optimistic about uh, Tunisia than many of my colleagues. At best, I'd say it only looks good in comparison to uh, its Arab Spring neighbors. So the question is, why this dismal record of failure? Why wasn't the Arab Spring much more like the Velvet Revolution in Eastern Europe in, in the early 1990s? So uh, Dan said that he doesn't like variables. I have to confess that I need to talk about variables. I don't like it. Um, <laughs> I but just if, said that to get a laugh. I actually love that. OK, good, good. So, so do I. I really do. So um, one variable that we try to measure as political scientists is uh, how democratic you are. And there's uh, lots of ways of doing this. One way is uh, there's a group at the University of Maryland. They put something out called the Polity 4 score. And you can go and look at Eastern Europe, the Polity 4 scores of every uh, Warsaw Pact member, right? They all jump. They all move from being really bad autocracies to looking pretty, you know, they're much more in the democratic zone right around 1990. Every single one, including Russia, the experience is really nice jump. And, um, and of the eight Warsaw Pact members today, only two of them have really uh, not made it or kept democracy. When we finally update the Polity 4 scores to take account of the Arab Spring, we're not going to see any jump like that. Right? In the, maybe we'll see it in Tunisia, but we're not going to see it anywhere uh, else. Uh, we're going to see, uh, we're going to see much more uh, continuity and change. And then the question is, why is that? And I think it comes to really two things that we've always known about how you get and keep democracy. That it requires a level of economic development and a level of state capacity, neither of which were present in the majority of Arab countries. Now, I want to be very clear. The argument I'm making, particularly once you get into saying that there are structural preconditions and economic development wasn't where it needs to be in order to sustain democracy, people think that I'm making an argument about how the Egyptian people or Muslim people are not ready for democracy. And this is, I think, the argument that Hillel alluded to and ascribed to uh, our colleague Shadi Hamid, who he says makes the argument that there is not a constituency for pluralism, et cetera. I actually think such arguments are wrong. Um, I think instead what I'm saying is simply recognizing the fact that you need to have a particular kind of political landscape in order to sustain a political system in which everyone agrees that turnover of power is a good thing and should be encoded in the political institutions of the state. And that kind of political landscape that you need to have is one not in which everybody's a liberal and everybody's reading Locke. No, I don't believe that. I think in the United States, we probably wouldn't get, if we tried to put the Bill of Rights through a referendum, I'm not sure it would pass today, right? What you need is a political landscape in which no side in any political struggle can defeat the other. 
And this insight actually comes from a famous line from Walter Lippmann back in 1939. He wrote uh, in a piece called The uh, Indispensable Opposition, he said that the survival of democracy depends upon a sufficiently even balance of power to make it impracticable for the administration to be arbitrary and for the opposition to be revolutionary and irreconcilable, right? Both sides have to have this belief that they can potentially win in a future democratic contest for them to continue to abide by the rules of the democratic game. And this equilibrium clearly did not exist in Morsi's Egypt, in, uh, in Egypt after Mubarak. In fact, one of the very sad ironies of political life in that country is that it went from being one kind of one-party state during the Mubarak era to being another kind of one-party state after Mubarak was overthrown, in which the Islamists, which, who far dwarfed their opponents in their access to resources, in their electoral history, et cetera, were able to run roughshod over them at the ballot box. And so it's not at all surprising that their opponents looked at the political game and thought that democracy and elections were a fool's errand, right? And that they needed to, to use Dan's words, appeal to the military to protect their basic interests, right? They concluded that the only way to prevent the new dominion of the Islamists was to welcome with open arms the not so tender ministrations of the men with guns. And I would Further note, just as a little wrinkle here, my argument is a little bit different from Professor Brumberg's in that the nature of the conflict doesn't matter to me, right? I actually don't think that the identity conflict in Egypt is that severe. I think that if we injected sodium pentothal into most of the leaders of the anti-coup, or sorry, the, uh, the pro-coup government, they were broadly uh, uh, sympathetic with the idea of Sharia being encoded in the principles of the state, et cetera. I don't think that's what the debate really was about. It was simply about the fact that these people are winning and we can't win under elections. Um, so none of this uh, should have proven surprising to us, obviously. Um, and I suspect for many people much smarter than myself, uh, it wasn't surprising. But I think there's some solace to be taken. This is now good solipsistic <laughs> mode again. To, uh, I think there's some solace to be taken in at least understanding what happened after as opposed to before it happened, because that's at least better than not understanding what happened at all. Thank you very much. Oh. Oh. So thank you, Tarek, also for your personal discipline. I get nervous when authors leave my immediate reach uh, to go uh, a distance away, and I don't have the ability to be an effective agent of horizontal accountability. Um, I'm going to pose this, uh, a, a trio of questions to each of you, uh, and you answer what you want, but I hope you can engage one another um, uh, more directly now and, and the, the most essential controversies that we're struggling with. One controversy, and you, I thought I heard you kind of somewhat agreeing with the implication of Hillel and Dan, um, but I wasn't certain, uh, Tarek, is um, who and what was the government under uh, Mohamed Morsi? That is, what you were saying is, yes, it's not surprising the other side perceived uh, an emerging one-party hegemony. Um, but was it? Uh, you know, and I think we're probably, uh, you know, most of us anyway feel that, A, it, let, let's get real here, was a military coup on uh, July 3rd of 2013, if I have the date right. Uh, and B, it was a tragedy that resistance to incipient or uh, consolidating authoritarianism, if we agreed that that's what it was, could not be mobilized by um, means other than the easy resort to the not so tender administrations of what Dan Brumberg now thinks is a, a fascist military regime, um, uh, or at least of a certain form. But um, was this authoritarianism, or was it just one party, uh, you know, one party dominant regime, because the Muslim Brotherhood had more votes? And what is the wider meaning of this? Is the option of um, moderate Islamist party playing the political game and ruling, and then not ruling, and rotation of power, and kind of the normalization? of this phenomenon. Uh, is that dead as an option in the region? If it is, 
How do we explain Inakta and the dramatically different decision uh, that Inakta, as the more or less ruling party in Tunisia, took last year to actually give up control of the government in preparation for uh, an election? So that's one set of questions. And the second is, what is Egypt today? Is it, uh, now here I heard a kind of disagreement between Hillel and Dan. Uh, Dan's saying, I happen to agree with it, that it's a kind of fascistic regime. Hillel, I thought I heard you saying, well, you know, kind of wait a minute. Uh, we don't really know, it doesn't look good maybe, but we don't know exactly what the character of it is going to be. Uh, and it could move, you know, in different directions. And then finally, if the three of you want to address this, uh, I'll simply note, and in this book, uh, we look at 15 states, uh, Arab states in the Middle East and North Africa, not all the Arab League states. And if you just look at another indicator, the Freedom House ratings of political rights and civil liberties, um, of the states that have changed during this period, uh, almost all of the ones that have changed have, have gone south uh, in the sense of becoming more authoritarian. And the only two that have improved in their freedom scores are one that you called, I think, quite aptly a lawless state, you know, virtually in essence then not a state at all, Libya, which I think calls profoundly into question how Freedom House could classify this country as a democracy today. And the second, Tunisia, which I think is clearly on the road to democracy. So, I mean, the ledger <laughs> doesn't look good. I think you were right about that. But um, we're fairly, is it, is it fair to say that we're still, it's still early days? Uh, and who knows how this is going to play out? And one of you mentioned Yemen, where I think there's been actually more than just a little bit of progress. Uh, the fact that they could agree on any kind of constitutional framework at all to hold that country together mm -hmm. seems to me to have been a major and vastly underappreciated yeah. achievement, not only by the Yemenis, but by our common friend, the United Nations mediator there, um, uh, Jamal Benamar. So Dan, why don't you start and we'll just go in the same order. Uh, I, you know, in response to Larry's questions, excellent questions, uh, and in response to Tarek's remarks, in fact, I, I see less, this may not be make you happy, I see less dissonance between the three of us than uh, and, and and far, I know you're pushing here for some conflict. Uh, and I know that I have, now that I've used uh, the F word, I mean fascism, uh, by about uh, Egypt, We're on TV um, fascism. I mean, you're not, you know, I'm not going to probably be an election observer there anytime soon, <laughs> I imagine. Uh, but um, it, it, it's there's the, clearly to me the system is much more shut. And there's a there's a when I use this term fascism, there's a profoundly psychological thing going on that's hard to grasp. The way the leader is manipulating the fears of, of the population, it's profoundly, uh, there's aspects of it that are very difficult to grasp. And, and, and it, it doesn't fit into, uh, it, there's a, all I can say is a profoundly irrational aspect of this. But I do want to answer your question and, and Tarek's as well by saying that, um, you know, I'm not saying that because there's an identity conflict, uh, this precludes um, a, a, a transition to democracy. Um, I, I would disagree with Tarek in the sense that I think that when you have a, a disagreement over identity, um, it's easy to manipulate people's fears. It's easy to manipulate their, 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 their most basic concerns about where they're going to end up in the system. Um, and it's up to leaders whether they're going to manipulate those or not and exaggerate them. And you mentioned Shadi Hamid's uh, book. You know, I haven't read it, but I was his his advisor, when he wrote his, you know, Time Flies, when he wrote his master's at Georgetown University, where much of, I must say, much of the, the, the background of this book was, seems to have been laid out. And he, his basic argument was that in an election with a conservative population, when leaders are trying to mobilize, they've got to play to, they, they have to, or they are tempted to play to that conservatism. And you've got to decide as a leader what you're going to do, what kind of agenda you're going to set. Um, and I don't think, you know, we can't expect all political leaders to be Nelson Mandela's. That's an exceptional record and an exceptional human being. But I would say that in terms of responding to, addressing the basic fears of the losers, um, this is something you see uh, paradoxically in its own way in Iran. I mean, the, 
this is an Islamist regime that is protected by a security apparatus, but also by a, an establishment of clerics and intellectuals who greatly fear losing their ideological uh, agenda through democratization. How do you engage that sort of perception? So I think that what we have in the region, to some extent, is a failure of leadership and a failure to understand that you have to really stand above all this. And when you talk about Hunushi, you're talking about somebody who under seems to have understood this. Um, and that makes me, by the way, both happy and worried, because it seems that Hunushi has kept that party together. And the story that, as I understand it in Tunisia, was that the radicals in the movement, every time they had an opportunity, tried to push their agenda, and they were pushed back, partly by Renouchi and partly by the circumstances of the assassinations and so on. But I wonder what will happen to the party if he's no longer there to guide it. Uh, because in fact, it wasn't for the lack of trying <laughs> that the, the, the elements in the party uh, you know, didn't, they didn't succeed happily enough, but I wonder what's gonna happen. But in any case, I think there's a relationship between the ideological field on the one hand, if you like, or the symbolic field, and how political leaders engage it and use it, and whether they're willing to s step beyond it. We do know, Mark Howard and others have demonstrated in their work repeatedly, that oppositions, you don't have transitions where oppositions don't have some basic sort of unity. It's not surprising that Juan effectively negotiated a pact with the military. That's fairly predictable. What they didn't understand was that they needed the leverage of a, a pact with the, the secularists. They did, that, they, that was the other critical thing they needed, and that they didn't get. Okay, uh, hello. Okay. Um, and thanks for the questions, uh, which hope focus the mind. Um, let me say one thing about Tunisia, it, it, because it, it does stand out as the, um, the one p actual or potentially positive. Um, first, I agree with, with Dan that a lot uh, turns on Renouchi. <coughs> Um, who, in my opinion, based on my experience with, with Brotherhood leaders, was, has been, is the most intelligent uh, in a very, very long time. Um, but one also has to observe that, uh, unlike in Egypt, the Brotherhood did not win an outright, or the Islamists did not win an outright <coughs> majority in the election. So um, you don't have to be a genius uh, or a very great intellect to see that there was a different situation you had to deal with. Now, of course, there are, there were a lot of people in Anafta who didn't see that and were pushing, as Dan said, for something more radical. But um, on uh, Ranucci and others could say, look, uh, the situation the situation doesn't permit that. And of course, in fact, we know that Ranucci said that. Um, and that is a function, really, of, uh, at least partially, of the character of Tunisian society, its different, um, uh, its different history, its different constituencies, and so forth. In which case, one had to make, uh, or it was, it was uh, useful to make a, a, an agreement with other sectors, like the labor unions or the secular, uh, secularly educated. Um, Which, uh, but you know, I, I'm even in Ranucci's case, he resisted a very long time before um, um, ending the uh, the government. I mean, it was not an easy thing for him to do. If you look, then compare that with the Egypt, which, and 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 um, Larry's questions about Egypt. Um, Dan just said, well, you know, Morsi needed to make a uh, he, he needed a pact with um, with the military and he needed a pact with the other f forces. Strictly speaking, that, you know, as a technical matter, that would have been a good idea. It's always good to be able to have more than one partner, just so at, least, at a minimum, so you could play them, them off against each other. But the other side doesn't really exist in, in the Egyptian polity. I mean, it's not, it's not non-existent, but it's not there as a, as a force which is equivalent to either the army or or um, uh, you know the Islamist constituencies, or even just the traditionally pious, it's just not there. Um, as for Egypt, uh, Larry posed two questions. One is, what was the government under Morsi, and where is Egypt today? And the question of whether 
Dan and Tark and I disagree about what, how to describe the current regime. What was the government under Morsi? Well, it seems to me that it, um, in the first place, it was a composite. It was Morsi pushing forward, and it was the still existing bureaucracy and all sorts of other um, institutions uh, which were not under their control. And there was this constant attempt on Morsi's side or the Brotherhood's side to push to control those things, resisted by the institutions, especially the judiciary, which um, first of all prevented Morsi from uh, in the very very quickly taking control of things and also drove him crazy, if I may <laughs> say so. And so the, you know, the critical thing seems to have been December 2012 when he just lost, lost it, I mean lost patience and tried to rule by decree, which he couldn't make stick. And that was, after that, um, the trajectory was downhill. And, um, you know, if I had been more C, I would have been more patient. But, uh, uh, but he couldn't, for whatever reasons he couldn't be, and I don't think he was getting advice from people like Schatzer to be patient. I think there was a kind of impulse there, let's, this is our time, let's make it work now. Um, as for where Egypt is today, um, um, if, I was suggesting that there's, that uh, both Dan and I in a way, and I think Tarek too, suggests that the new autocracy is not the old autocracy Absolutely. because it's, uh, for one thing, you've passed through this, this experience and besides Mubarak is gone. And a lot of the old autocracy had to do with the autocrat <laughs> and what he was like uh, and where he came from and how he came to office, um, which was, of course, through the assassination of Anwar Sadat. So all of that create um, systems, structures are important, but in autocracies, agents are also important and who they are. It, it remains to be seen what Sisi is like, but he has come through this experience. And again, it seems to me um, he doesn't want to be the colorless bureaucrat that Mubarak is. Sure. <laughs> and he may, but he also may think it's not possible to be the colorless bureaucrat, that he needs, maybe it's fascism will turn out to be the right word for it, but that he needs to find um, a theme for the populism that has brought him, to, will bring him to power. And how, how successful he will be with that, I don't know, but remember, again, the difference, going back in a way to the difference between Tunisia and, and, uh, and Egypt, leaving aside the Brotherhood, the Salafis got 30% of the vote, and some portion of that group is now defend, is supporting him and defending him. So if they're useful to him or need, and, and he needs them, he will try to give them some satisfaction, and the satisfaction presumably comes in the form of appropriating some of the religious sensibility that informs them. That's what I, what I mean. And it may, that actually may work. I, it, it doesn't fix the economy, but it may work as a, uh, as a means for binding society together. Great, thank you, Hillel, and now Tarek. Great, thank you, uh, Larry, for a great uh, set of questions, and to um, Dan and Hillel for some really great insights that leave me very little uh, to add. I guess. If we just step back a little bit and try to answer the comparative question, why is it that Tunisia seems to have worked out and Egypt didn't, right? And I think that Hillel has, um, uh, his comments sort of validate the perspective I, I, I tried to offer, which is simply, in Tunisia, you did have a much more balanced political landscape. If you were a non-Islamist in the Tunisian situation, it was not a uh, out of the realm of possibility. In fact, it was quite likely that when you have a new set of elections, you'll be able to even do uh, better. And so from the standpoint of Anahda, as uh, Halal notes, it didn't require a kind of remarkable uh, Ghanoushi type character. It just required somebody with a minimal level of understanding of politics to know that your opponents are ones with whom you have to negotiate. Now think about in the Egyptian case. In the Egyptian case, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood is running in elections, and who does it turn out is the Muslim Brotherhood's most potent electoral competitor? It is not the so-called liberal, so-called secularist. It is, in fact, a slightly even more conservative party called 
uh, Hezb al uh, the or the Salafi movement, right? Um, which, um, to steal a description that Khalil Anani mentioned in one of his articles, uh, the opponents of Hezb al often referred to them as ultra-conservative religious monsters, right? Uh, which is a great <laughs> line. So, um, and so if you're the Muslim Brotherhood and you're thinking politically, who am I going to have to uh, um, uh, uh, you know, outflank? I have to outflank these uh, Salafists. And so it's not surprising that um, they, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood thought uh, in terms of its most potent co political competitors and not in terms of the so-called seculars who would eventually give the military an excuse to drive uh, tanks uh, down the, the street. So I really think that it's um, a function of this political landscape and not necessarily uh, a particular um, particular actor. Um, and you know, it's interesting. You know, Dan mentioned the the identity conflict. So I really don't believe that identity conflict was really important. But if you think about sort of the literature that we have in the democratization business, right? So we have on two sides the structuralists who think. You know, you only get democracy if you achieve a certain level of development and societal differentiation, et cetera, et cetera, ad nauseum. And then on the other side, you have people basically going back to, I'd say, Dankwart Rustow, who in 1970 said, there are no prerequisites to democracy. You only have to have a political elite that agrees on democracy as the rules of the game. But if you read his piece carefully, it's written in 1970, he says what you need is an inconclusive political struggle such that the participants in that struggle conclude democracy is important. The point is inconclusive. Neither side can win, right? Which means, I, th I mean, he doesn't recognize this, but I think he meant that you had to have two equally matched sides. And how do you get two equally matched sides? Well, that comes back to structure and societal differentiation and latent pluralism, et cetera. So I think that's really what was lacking in, uh, in the Egyptian case and what's lacking in a lot of these cases. And let's remember, thinking about Syria, thinking about Saudi Arabia, thinking about uh, Bahrain, all of these countries, uh, thinking about Jordan, all of these places have significant structural barriers to getting to democracy, not least of which is that they are hugely diverse, that there is there have always been challenges to the authority of the central state, both from below by people who never really were reconciled to the authority of, say, the Hashemites in Jordan, or, and also from above by uh, you know, transnational uh, movements like political Islam and Arab nationalism. So these are all have always been very fragile states and have never been uh, tremendously great um, uh, fertile ground for the development of democracy. And I will stop there in the hopes that we can have a good conversation. Larry, since you're looking for a bit of dissension, let me just say in response to my, my colleague Tarek, Rostel also said that his model only applied to countries where there was consensus on national identity. Yeah, where that there was, was the one background. There was but that. in Egypt there is that. Well, I mean, I... We could have a debate about no, that. No, 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 but national identity, he did not mean, he did not mean that there is consensus over, you know, you know, the role of, say, religion and politics. He only meant that we all agree that we're Egyptians and we should live in the yeah. same mm, polity. What the country yeah. is. Right. Well, what, what is striking to me is the, the enduring uh, struggle over what it means to be Egypt, what it means to be Syria, what it means to be Algeria, and what it means to be Tunisian. I, I think those things are, are linked. Let me just note one other variable, and then I'm going to go to the two of you, because you two raised your hands first. Um, uh, and that is, I want to channel uh, our late esteemed founding member of the editorial board, Juan Lentz, and his frequent co-author, Alfred Stapon, and simply noting, Egypt had a presidential system, Tunisia had a parliamentary system. Morsi won the first round of the presidential vote with what, about 27%? Mm -hmm. uh, and barely won uh, with, what, 51.5% the runoff election, it does kind of enable and tempt people to grandiose projects uh, when you have presidentialism. Okay, you were first. Go ahead. <coughs> and maybe if you want, you could identify yourself. Sure. My name, my name is Mohammed Abdullah. I'm from the Syria Justice and Accountability Center. I have a question. Hilal mentioned the role of Turkey and its influence in, in the area, but none, none of the speakers touched on the role of other Arab countries, specifically the Gulf countries, who has clear no interest of having democracy spreading to other countries, and contributed to Egypt, clearly, Qatar funding to the Muslim Brotherhood, and the Saudi and Emirates funding to the military coup, and how they both contributed and played, and that's back to the identity, Muslim Brotherhoods versus <laughs> military governments. And my question more is if you can touch on this a little bit, and where the U.S. leadership here, because the U.S. can kind of impose kind of balance of power here and, and basically 
prevent these countries from destroying the fragile democratic systems that's uh, uh, coming out of this of this uprising. And one comment to Tarek, you mentioned on the score of the Eastern European countries that jumped quickly. I think that's related again from the US and Western involvement to crush the Soviet unions. And they put really lots of efforts to support that area versus no effort from the United States and from the Western countries to make that area in Middle East now stable and survival because it's surprising to me and shocking and it's unfortunate to see administration here doesn't see that it's in it's in the national interest of the United States that these emerging democracies are really okay. stable democracies and sustainable peace in the area it's something otherwise going to shift to Libya militias or Al Qaeda place like Syria Great. thank you thank you uh, do keep your questions brief because we don't we only have a limited amount uh, of time. my name is Matar Ibrahim a former MP from Bahrain my question is in, is in the same direction uh, to, to to Dan specifically you spoke about the fear uh, f uh, by the Alawites from the uh, the Sunnis and the the fear from Sunnis in Bahrain from the Shia um, are you assuming if uh, the Bahrain is just totally Sunnis, it will be much easier for them to 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 be uh, to go through a transition toward democracy? Uh, because I don't feel this is the case. Where if Saudis are having the current role in Bahrain, they don't mind to uh, oppress Sunnis as they are de doing with the human rights activists in Saudi Arabia, and. The other factor is uh, the U.S. role. As you know, we have the fifth fleet in Bahrain, and the interest of U.S. government is uh, preserved by, by, by the current regime. So what if Bahrain is totally Sunni? What will change? I, I, I want uh, to yeah, ask you briefly. to dig inside the issue of identity. Can, you, uh, can we uh, separate the, the internal problems of identity from the foreign policy of U.S. government when it comes to Bahrain? Okay, uh, thank you. Yes, you're next. Thank you. Huh? Abdel Mawgut Dardiri, a, an elected member of the Egyptian parliament representing the Freedom and Justice Party, and a spokesperson for the Foreign Relations Committee. Living in Egypt during all these uh, three past three years, uh, I, I don't agree with the characterization that Morsi failed or had to rule by decree. Uh, the situ it's very important to contextualize the situation in which Morsi was. Morsi did not rule with the Freedom and Justice Party government. He ruled with the National Unity government. Very recently, the Interior Minister stated that uh, they did not listen to anything from Morsi. Even when he insisted on getting information, they would give him wrong information. Uh, and the military controlled more than 50% of the economy. They controlled gas, electric uh, companies. So they were able really to uh, make serious uh, challenges. I, I, I still, the Muslim Brotherhood or the Freedom and Justice Party uh, failed not only alone, but with other political forces. They failed first on agreeing on the referendum. I think the beginning of the failure started with the March 19th referendum, where all agreed stayed away from the revolutionary course into a gradual uh, democratic process. Uh, and I think the belief uh, and the trust of formal democracy uh, was a, 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 a big mistake on all parties. Uh, and there was a need to keep a balance of both the revolutionary uh, path and the democratic path. I, I, I myself called for the people not to leave Tahrir Square at all until we are really sure that uh, the country is moving in the right direction. Uh, I am still optimistic. I, I disagree with the pessimism that I hear from time to time. I think the revolution is likely to continue if we look at it. I think the transition is still going on. I think the people in Egypt still have a say in what's going on, and they're not likely to accept the status quo. And they will work. We'll, we're trying very hard now to work with other secular forces and all of us realizing that we made mistakes and we need to push the democratic course forward. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, over to Ali and then in back there and then maybe we'll be able to come to uh, Ali Abu Zakouk from the oh, Citizenship yes, Forum for Democracy and Human Development in Benghazi, Libya. Uh, I would like to ask the panelists uh, on an issue that none of them touch upon is the role of the deep state in counter 
the uh, ways that these uh, you know countries of the Arab Spring have really uh, moved on, and what is uh, you know Egypt or Libya or Tunisia or any other things? How did they really uh, either maneuvered or manipulated their power to bring about or to put a, a break on the movement of the Arab Spring countries? Okay, uh, to this woman here, to Sam Tadros, I'm not sure how many we're going to be able to take after that. Could you stand up? Well, my name is Maryam Amar Sadegi from uh, Tavana. It's an e-learning institute for Iranian civil society. Um, Iranian uh, activists are looking at Egypt um, a lot these days, both in terms of looking backward and forward, backward in the sense that there are a lot of comparisons Iranians make uh, between what is happening in Egypt now or under Morsi, really, and, and the Iranian revolution. And also, but the, fo the forward uh, look in terms of, well, we could have a Tahrir Square that actually, or we could have a green movement that actually gets somewhere. Um, my question is about Tarek Massoud's um, analysis that in order for things to really take shape and consolidate, uh, or at least move forward toward democracy in any kind of reliable way, you need to have both sides or all sides feel that there's a chance, at least a chance of winning elections, and that this was not the case in Egypt. My question is, from the perspective not of an analyst, but of a, of a person, a human being, or a, particularly an activist on the ground in Egypt, when you see what is happening under Morsi, what is the right thing to do? What is the moral thing to do? Do you wait and wait and wait and see what happens and, to, and then wait for that next election when, as you say, you know that there's no chance of winning? Or do you try to stop the process, as undemocratic as it is, with the hope that you're, not, you're gonna stop the infringement of all manner of human rights? Okay, Sam. Samuel Tadros, the Hudson Institute. Uh, three very quick questions. The first, um, there, there was a comment, many comments about pact making and the failure to make pacts. I wonder if the panelists could comment on whether the revolutionary atmosphere, the euphoria of revolution itself as a phenomenon is inducive to making pacts or whether the fact that those regimes fell through revolutions meant that the possibility of making pacts was limited, to say the least. The second is regarding a comment that Professor Brumberg made about democracy without Democrats <laughs> and the transition paradigm. Uh, Tarek mentioned briefly the non-Islamists, the liberal, seculars, Democrats, whatever you want to call them. I wonder if we still share this view of the possibility of democracy without committing committed Democrats who are aiming to achieve it. The third, um, to Hillel, and, and I, I mean, it's a, in a sense, the panelists didn't talk about this point, but I think uh, such a distinguished panel, I might use the opportunity to um, have them address the topic, is the future of Islamism. Uh, Hillel's article is an answer, of course, to a long debate with uh, Roy about this question, but how the, the panelists see the future of Islamism. Uh, many have commented on an end of Islamism, uh, I get the feeling the panelists probably don't agree with that. What, where do we see Islamism going from this point forward? Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna give you the last question very briefly, please, and then we've gotta to go to our panelists. My name is Amin Mahmoud. I'm with the Center of Egyptian-American uh, Relations, and the Sudan, I uh, thank you for the two words, the coup and the fascism, and that's what the course in Egypt now, I would like to ask your opinion about the administration. They're going to meet uh, Nabil Fahmi uh, tomorrow. Uh, what, what they should do, and what's your opinion they should do? You mean the Obama administration? Obama administration and uh, uh, Kerry, in particular, meeting uh, Nabil Fahmi, the foreign minister of Egypt, okay. uh, next uh, week. I'm going to mix it up here and go in reverse order uh, to conclude. So. Uh, oh, great. Well, well, thank you again, and these were a, a wonderful set of questions from a really uh, engaged audience. And unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to answer all of them 
I mean, I actually am able to, but it would be very rude if I tried to. Uh, so, 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 um, You're more than able to. Let, let me respond to uh, Sam's questions. Um, Sam said, why was there this failure to make pacts? Could it possibly be that in a revolutionary atmosphere, uh, people are not prone to pact making? Of course, I would note in the Egyptian case, there was a pact, right? It was just a pact between the Islamists and the army over the, uh, uh, over the political timetable in that country. It just was a pact that excluded uh, a particular set of actors who nobody thought was terribly consequential, but later proved their ability to at least uh, uh, make problems and spoil uh, the, uh, the political game. The bigger question about whether you can have democracy without Democrats, I certainly believe that you can. Um, I'll give you an example. We define, Sam, Sam Huntington has this sort of simple test of whether a country is a democracy. Correct me if I get the details wrong, Dan, but it's something like you have to have had two turnovers of power within 60 years in order to be cl no, classified as a democracy. test for consolidation. Consolidation, absolutely. So a few years ago, I, I read it, sorry, sorry, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I was, I was thinking, Larry's moderating, okay. So, so, but the big point is, I remember an interview a few years ago with Karl Rove, where Karl Rove said something like, you know, we want to have a 100-year Republican majority, i.e., by the standards of Huntington, not a Democrat, right? Everybody want, nobody wants to be a Democrat. Everybody wants to rule forever. So the, you know, to be committed to that uh, is, is, I think, too high a bar. It's, you have to be forced to accept it, as opposed to actually fundamentally uh, committed uh, to it. In terms of the future of Islamism, it really depends on how we define it. If we define Islamism as you know, the Muslim Brotherhood, it's an open question. I, I really don't know. Um, if we define Islamism as the belief that uh, Islam should structure political institutions, if we define Islamism, as my friend Thomas Heghammer does, as political activism using with reference to Islam, that's definitely not going to disappear, right? Uh, and it's not, you know, uh, and I think uh, both Hillel and Dan noted that the current Egyptian regime has its own uh, kind of Islamism. After all, remember the interim constitution that the current regime put forward the minute that Morsi was overthrown, they took one of the most objectionable articles in the right. uh, Morsi constitution and put it in <laughs> article one. Right, uh, the most uh, quote-unquote Islamist article in that constitution, clearly signaling, right, this is not uh, an, a revolution against Islamism, instead it is a revolution against the Muslim Brotherhood and the clique of the, of the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, very quickly, in terms of the jump in the polity score that we observed in Eastern Europe and why we didn't have that in the Middle East, and your argument is that it's because the United States was involved, we have a negative degrees of freedom problem here, i.e. not enough cases and too many variables. However, I would note that these Eastern European countries were far more developed than the Arab world is now along all of these uh, standard uh, dimensions, and so there were lots of reasons to expect them uh, to do better. And then finally, to come to uh, uh, Larry's uh, big question about the presidentialism. Was, in fact, the failure in Egypt encoded in the political institutions that they selected uh, at the outset, and I believe that this also relates to uh, some of the comments of uh, Dr. Abdul Mawgud Dirderi, uh, who uh, Dr. Abdul Mawgud makes the point that in fact Morsi was not trying to rule as a, in the kind of presidential mode that Juan Lentz and Al Stepan know. And I think in this case, Dr. Abdul Mawgud is right. Think about we always mention the November 22 Constitutional Declaration of Morsi as Exhibit A in the Bill of Particulars against the Muslim Brotherhood. And what did he do in that constitutional declaration? First of all, why was he able to issue constitutional declarations? The reason he was is because once he gets elected, the Supreme Court dissolves the legislature, right? So now he is legislature and executive after a little bit of maneuvering. And as legislature and executive gets to make constitutional declarations, not a situation he created, a situation he inherited. Then what did he try to do? He tried to bring back the legislature not because he's committed to having parliamentary oversight, but because it was dominated by the Muslim Brotherhood. Nonetheless, he tried to bring back the legislature. The military said no. So finally, he comes around to November 22nd, and he says, my decisions are above judicial oversight. But then he tells you what decisions he's talking about. Number one, to, br to make the upper house of parliament the legislature. Think about this, a president trying to bring back a legislature. And number two, that the democratically legitimated constituent assembly, which was then writing the constitution, could not be dissolved. So Morsi's supporters, and I think Dr. Abdul Mawgud would say, he wasn't trying to destroy democracy. He wasn't acting in this kind of presidential mode. He was actually doing the opposite. I don't want to pass judgment on that. I only think that there's enough question about this. 
There is nobody in Egypt who is a hero. There's nobody who's covered themselves in glory. And this gets back to uh, uh, Professor Brumberg's big point that Egypt is now fascist. Uh, I, I don't like to use that term, but I would say I don't think, I think regardless of who would have uh, come out ahead in the in the, the summer of 2013, whether it was Morsi or his opponents, the Egypt we would be talking about now would be a very, very depressing and uh, uh, inhospitable place regardless. Wow. Okay, hello, you're next. <laughs> Is that all you have to say? <laughs> I spoke for the shortest. <laughs> it's okay. Um, I'm trying, uh, sorry, trying to, uh, there's a, there's a fair convergence between some of these questions, uh, but obviously uh, they come at things from, from different perspectives. Uh, let me begin in a way backwards with the question about the role of the deep state, which was raised by one of my speakers. That, yes, uh, be, because it, I think it reflects, it, it relates directly to what, in fact, Tarek was just talking about with respect to Egypt, that there was in that case, uh, and I agree with, with the characterizations that were just offered, uh, you had a deep state that was both functioning um, as an opposition to uh, the, the uh, elected authority and also not functioning, I mean dysfunctional in a way that was no longer descri describable constitutionally. I mean, as I think Tarek was implying, that um, uh, there was no clear legislature. There was no clear, uh, no clear lines of authority. So, uh, to some degree, Morrissey made them up as he went along, um, and it was that. But what I meant earlier by the fact that um, uh, he just lost lost patience. So I don't think, in fact, um, it was simply un, unimportant that the um, the super constitutional decree was made. It came out of a sort of circumstance, but it 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 deepened the problem because it didn't, there was still no real constitutional authority. And it conveyed more generally to people that now, uh, either there was now a different spirit at the, in the government. Um, so in each case, I think there's, you know, the problem of these, the, pri the pre-existing state, unless it collapsed altogether, as it seems to have done in Libya, uh, means that you're going to have, a, uh, uh, that's gonna play a role in the transition. Um, the role of, um, of outsiders, uh, both that's both regional and the U.S. I think that's been the way it was put in two different sets of questions. Um, in the case of the the regional, I, this is sort of where I began with my remarks that in fact they had a, a, a very large impact on internal developments in different countries. And since the region didn't act as a whole, but in conflict with it, you know, with, with itself. Um, it affected the trajectory of these these events, especially in Egypt, where, as you say, the uh, gutter was uh, was um, uh, supporting uh, the Brotherhood government, and um, and uh, others were opposing it. Um, the role of the U.S. Um, is a different matter, um, and here. It's, a, it's obviously a very long discussion because we had separate, obviously, uh, reactions to to the different uh, revolts and so forth. But at the very beginning, in the early spring of, of 2011, the president was quoted as saying, uh, effectively, I want to keep hands off of this, period. He did it more positively. The statement was, these are organic revolutions. And organic revolutions are good. Why are they good? Because they reflect the, the plant <laughs> that, that's there, uh, the people who are there. Um, and the problem with, uh, with, with us getting involved is we're outsiders and we would, uh, uh, we would distort the growth of these plants. Um, what, and I think by and large, I, I know that in Egypt, everyone claims that um, uh, the president has been uh, on the side of their opponents, but it's uh, <laughs> that um, he's, he was pro-brotherhood and he was anti-brotherhood. Uh, he was nowhere, uh, basically, in any consistent, consistent way, which went back, I think, to the original notion. These, we make things worse, we, we Americans make things worse when we intervene. 
therefore we're not going to, and they will, this will all be healthier. It turns out that organic growth uh, has liabilities of its own. Uh, and uh, we're now in a situation, as, uh, as we can see, for example, especially and emphatically in the case of Syria. But we have not prepared uh, the way for, uh, th that was in a way uh, by design, but it was, uh, it was conceived of as benevolently. It was not supposed to be to serve our interests. And the proof that we were being good was that it served no interest of ours. Um, uh, and it also hasn't served any of interest, but it hasn't served the interests of anyone in the region either, which is, which is the problem. And uh, we, related to that, I would say, um, what's the other thing? The, um, going back to, uh, to our, uh, the speaker from the Freedom and Justice Party, uh, I, I, I hope it's clear. It seems to me that um, President Morsi had, you know, had a lot of obstacles thrown in his path. Uh, those were, from a democratic point of view, dubious. Um, uh, in, in fact, this discussion about that took place earlier in, at, at NED, I think about a year and a half ago, or a year ago anyway. On the other hand, um, uh, the response wasn't particularly democratic either. So that's where that's how we got to to the present uh, circumstances. I think I have to stop there. Great. Yeah. Uh, well, a lot of excellent questions. You know, I my sense on on regional international factors is that they're very are in, very important in the case of Syria and of course in Libya in some way they're decisive. But if I think counterfactually. I'm not as convinced that they're the, really ultimately the decisive factors. Uh, in, uh, I, I think the ones that we've been talking about, which are very much local uh, for the most part, are, are really the crucial ones. I do want to say, you know, when I, ter when I termed the regime fascist, it's not that this, uh, we don't know what this regime is yet. I mean, we really don't know. It's a kind of fascist moment. It's a kind of moment where a leader is exploiting the fears, the deepest fears of the population, and identifying enemies who not only are enemies, but they deserve this or that fate. Um, so when the court uh, says 560 of these uh, are going to be sentenced, and a member of the government says, why not 20,000 or 10,000, you, you've got to you wonder, what's going on? This is a really strange situation and a very dispiriting one. Where it will go, I don't know. I am optimistic in the sense that when I talk about these divisions, they're not, they're not ironclad. And that, by the way, in my own work, I don't talk about Islamists and secularists. I talk about Islamists and non-Islamists. Because the non-Islamic rubric is much bigger and much more complex than a merely secular Islamist struggle. And I think that there are possibilities for coalition building in Egypt that may emerge as a result of the learning process that comes from this, and as a result of the, uh, uh, the, the uh, mistakes that leaders uh, look at and assess and the kinds of alliances. And there's more flexibility and malleability in the identity map in all these countries then would be suggested by the mere notion of, say, secular Islamist divisions, at least in many of them. Um, but the, there, the Tariq is right. The balance of power is absolutely critical. But notice that whenever we talk about these identities, we're not talking about workers versus the bourgeoisie. We're always talking the language of identity politics, and you can't separate them out. Now, on the last question, this issue, this issue of Islamists, I mentioned it in the article. You know, I said that the Tunisia situation doesn't resolve it. I, it was fascinating when Ghanoushi was here. Who did he encounter the most questions from? Islamists. They kept asking him, well, you say Islam is, you know, that's, that's what's left of our agenda. <laughs> you say Islam is accepting pluralism and accepting working with others. And that, if, you, if this is what it means, then this is not an Islamist agenda anymore. <laughs> what does it mean to have identity politics when a political leader has the courage? I think it's more than simply the balance of power. He's been thinking about these things for a long time, and I think, you know, he means them. But at the end of the day, when he defines uh, an Islamist agenda uh, or uh, the agenda of his party in ways that question whether Islam, what the role of Islam will be uh, as a part as, a, sort of, as opposed to just simply a mere inspiration for identity, uh, there, are, there are plenty within his party who believe it means much more. And in that sense, the Tunisia situation hasn't resolved the Islamist issue at all. 
and we will see what happens when there is an election. Let's not, it is true that because the NACTA party only got whatever it was, 40, 45 percent, they faced a situation where it would have been crazy to try to impose the will. They did for a long time. But there were all kinds of peculiarities in the results of the elections, including the, the election of our friend uh, Mohammed al Hashmi Hamdi's supporters and all kinds of strange things. And we don't know where it's going to go. So the real test will be after this next election and what happens when um, perhaps uh, the Nakta party may do better than it did the first time and how it is ready to uh, share power and, and work with the, with the uh, opposition. Yeah, I, I, uh, thanks, Larry. I, I did want to add one thing that occurred to me in the context of uh, Dan's remarks, I, I, which is in a way to stress a point that Dan made before. There are the, you know, there are the givens, the, the structural things, and so forth and so on, but then there's also just a question of leadership and, um, and how leaders um, take into account uh, very specific events and respond to them. And I would say, I mean, I, couple of things in the course of the events of the last three years, specifically in Egypt, struck me very powerfully both at the time and in retrospect. The first was the demonstration of February 18th, um, which was the first demonstration, more or less, that was dominated by the Brotherhood in Tahrir uh, Square, um, at which the, the leadership decided to invite uh, Yusuf Karlawi to speak and decided to throw Wael Gunaim off the, off the platform. That was a moment to reflect on what was, go, you know, what kinds of things you needed to succeed in the revolution. And um, a, implicitly a decision was made, and I think it was, um, it, it was made uh, incorrectly. The other, th other things like that were the, um, the tower probably remembers this, uh, the exact circumstances when you know, the assassin of, uh, of Anwar Sadat was asked to s sit next to uh, General Sisi at, um, at, a, at a public event. That was not probably a very smart thing to do. So, from the, first of all, from the perspective of having a successful pursuit of your, of your own program, and from the larger perspective of the Egyptian or the Arab interest, those kinds of things matter a lot and, 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 and turn out one way or the other how, they, how things turn out one way or the other can actually be trivial as they are or small as they are, be actually fairly decisive. Thank you, uh, Hillel. Uh, thank all three of you for a remarkable panel discussion. Let me close with these observations before I thank my colleagues. Um, first of all, in answer to your question, uh, it wasn't answered and I think it would be very lengthy uh, discussion to try to answer it. I just say one thing, whatever the Obama administration does, um, I hope it will not commit the ultimate and unsustainable, unsustainable hypocrisy of um, declaring that Egypt is now making sufficient progress for <laughs> democracy. Um, I, I think, you know, you have to begin with fist, first order principles, and the first order principles are uh, not to make a fool of ourselves again in the Arab world by, you know, uh, turning things upside down and pretending that we don't even see what's happening. Uh, it, however you characterize it, uh, whether you want to use the F word or not, it's a deeply authoritarian moment in Egypt. Over a thousand people have been killed since the military came to power. Over 5,000 are in jail. I think there's very clear evidence of torture being used, friends uh, of democracy and liberal principles uh, have had to flee the country. Uh, in one case, a scholar uh, we've wanted to bring to the United States isn't being allowed to leave the country. And of course, many people are suffering much worse fates. So uh, we have strategic interests, but it'd be nice if we'd stand up for our principles now and then too. Um, or at least call things as, as everyone else in the world would, would see them. The second thing I'd like to end on a hopeful note, so let me just uh, observe this. Um, we've had a situation for 40 years where the Arab world was the only region in the world, the only significant, however you drew the map, clustering of states in the world, where there wasn't a single democracy. Um, and now, there, according to Freedom House, I think correctly judged, there is a democracy in Tunisia. 
It's transitional. It has elements of fragility, things we should be concerned about. We shouldn't take it for granted. And that's precisely my point. If I were an American policymaker, I'd be saying, okay, what's the economic agenda for embracing and lifting up this economy, for strengthening the state, for partnering with the civil society and political institutions? You've got to start somewhere. This country is crucially important in an outside, outsized way, I think, to the future of, of democracy and freedom uh, throughout the world. And the final thing is, you know, I really do believe, I think my colleagues agree, we're really still in very early days here in terms of a process of the struggle for, to use uh, one of the Arabic words, karama, dignity, uh, throughout the region. And this isn't going away. Uh, and there are many historical events that are going to unfold in the years to, and decades to come that I think are going to rock these regimes or induce them to come to terms with the demands for dignity, accountability, and popular sovereignty. So we're going to have to do another edition of this book, Mark. That's the one thing I think we can say for sure. Mark Platner, uh, my co-editor, uh, thank you very much. Uh, all of the staff of the Journal of Democracy, the National Endowment for Democracy, and our three panelists, thank you all.